All right, we are here with none other than two-time IBF junior featherweight world champion, the Canadian kid, everyone's favorite guest, Steve Molitor. Welcome back, man, to the Great Fight North Boxing Podcast video edition this time. Hey, Jason, it's great to see you. Great to see Ryan. Um, it's tough beyond this lockdown. I got the lockdown beer going on, but you guys look good. Oh, man, you're looking great, honestly. I know Scalia's been commenting on the beard look the whole time. Scalia's was much longer before mine, too. I decided to trim it because I wanted to let you have the shine tonight. You know what I mean? <laughs> and speaking of shine, I see some shiny trinkets behind you, man. Walk us through what's behind you right now. Um, those are just my two world titles and some collage and some pictures for my fights. But the first one I won in um, England in 2006, November 11th, first Michael Hunter. And then in 2010, March 27th, I beat Endeloff at Casino Rama for the second one. Amazing, man. Two-time champ. And we actually have a, a fan question for you about that after, but we'll, we'll get to it a little bit later on. Um, first off, man, talk to us. How has quarantine been treating you, buddy? I mean, we asked this to everybody on the show right now because everybody's experience is different. How have you been holding up? Um, quarantine, like I, I, uh, I'm a... Uh, operations manager at Triple M Metal, or a scrap metal recycling company. We're um, deemed an essential service because, you know, I mean, um, recycling is part of everything, making stuff for the hospitals. So I've been working, so it's been keeping me sane. And, you know what I mean? Yep. So I kind of basically live my own life aside from what I miss most, and it's, and it's, and it's hurting me. I, I don't get to go to the gym. Yes. And that is something that obviously we're going to be talking about here because I mean, look, you're retired. Um, it's been several years now, but every time I see you, uh, every time Scalia sees you, you're in fighting shape. Like you, you do not balloon up in weight and, you know, get out of shape. It's just not you. So uh, talk to us about what you've been doing in that sense is you can't be in the gym. What are you doing to stay in shape besides just, you know, um, hanging out, working and taking care of the kids? Before this, um, even before this lockdown, like even before this lockdown, I always just kept running. Um, even when I work out and do weights, I always still run. So that's what I've just had kind of had to be my main source is running. But you know, sticking to my diet and you know, trying to do my best just to, to stay in shape. Well, it looks like you're doing a good job, man. Like I said, you got uh, everything on point still. You got your hair on point. Um, <laughs> but uh, look, you know, everybody's kind of bored right now, as we know. And one thing I wanted to talk to you about, we were chatting earlier in the day, um, to just get your take on it, because I think you can provide a very unique perspective as a retired fighter. We see uh, a lot of retired fighters right now uh, feeling the quarantine, feeling the, 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 I guess, the need to be doing something. And guys like Mike Tyson, first of all, did you see that Mike Tyson video of him hitting the mitts and stuff the other day? Crazy. I love it. I seen him at Casino Rama in January do his yes. thing. Um, and obviously he's a legend but like you know he's you know he's got a little belly like you know he's enjoying the retired life like he didn't look like he's in any sort of fighting shape when i seen that video and the ferocity in his punches and, and, the, and the bad intentions it's just like holy fuck the guy's a different dude but yeah. i love it i love mike tyson fat and funny or, or slim and tough i love him either way yeah well right now he's looking slim and tough there is no question about that and everybody is kind of going on this whole thing about is tyson coming back i heard there's going to be holyfield coming back we saw james tony put out a video saying he wants in um what i kind of wanted to get from you is is your thoughts first is your thoughts on these kind of guys coming back once they've walked away and let's be real they walked away for good we're not talking about jordan walking I, I just watched the last dance of course so we're not talking about michael jordan walking away in 93 only to come back two years later these are guys <clears throat> yourself who have said okay i'm hanging up the gloves my time in the ring is done what do you think about this whole thing of these kind of guys saying okay you know what maybe i'm back maybe i'm gonna come back, back. and do one more fight um 
Mike Tyson's the greatest heavyweight ever, one of the most exciting fighters ever. I love him and I have the utmost respect for Mike Tyson. <clears throat> He's very polite when I met him at Casino Rima backstage. Um, but like you said, it's not a two year layoff. It's like a 12 or however, 15 year or whatever year layoff. And he did retire at the end where he had lost his last fight to Kevin McBride, who in reality is a nobody in the heavyweight pitcher. And, you know, I mean, he went out, you know, against a bum. So to think he can come back at 53, yeah, he looks good on the pads. Anybody can look good on the pads, realistically. Mike Tyson is a killer, greatest heavyweight ever. But at 53, I don't think it's realistic if you were to fight somebody like Deontay Wilder or Tyson, uh, Tyson Fury. I just don't think it's realistic. No, no, I, I, I don't, I don't think so either. Like, obviously, you know, I've never really been in the ring, of, of course. But just as an observer, it doesn't seem like a like a realistic thing. Let's take you as an example, a guy who stayed in shape. You're, you're still a young guy. I think we're the same age, right? I think we, you, you, you hit the big number just a, a week or two before me. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you still feel good. I'm sure you still wake up and feel pretty fit, minus all of the aches and pains from all of your years in the ring. But I mean, could you do it? Could you say tomorrow, you know what? I'm making another run at it. I'm going to get back into the gym. I'm going. Like, could you do it physically? I don't think I could do it physically, especially to the level that I was at. Could I do it to get in the ring? I'm sure I could get in the ring and, and you know I mean, and get to a certain level. Do I want it? Every day when I go for a run, I'm like, you know what? Fuck, dude. Like, <laughs> You know, I mean, you did it for such a long time. I think you get back in shape and, you know, bang off an eight rounder. But realistically, even in my last fight when I fought um, Carl Frank, I was still in pretty good shape and I hadn't had too many miles on my, at, at that point, I never took any serious beatings. But even at that point, I was just a step below the top level. So to come back and to have a six or eight round fight, you know, I mean, it doesn't interest me at all. So have you ever thought about like, if you were around today, you would have made like so much more money, you know, in this era. Absolutely. You know, so, you know with guys like PBC and Al Heyman and just, yeah, the money's just gone up incredibly and, and things are a lot different, but you know, I mean, I, I, <clears throat> I'm grateful for what Alan Trombley and Casino Rama did for me. Um, like I've said before to the media, when me and Alan Trombley had a little rift, Don King called me personally and said, Stevie, you know, come down to Florida. And then I told him what I was getting, he goes, honestly, a hundred grand for a voluntary defense, US dollars. I don't even think I could give you that. And I talked up there and he was paying Israel Vasque and Oscar Larios at that time who were having a trilogy fight with the second fight mm -hmm. around the same amount of money. So, I mean, I feel as, you know, considering it was 10 years ago, I made pretty good money for a, a white boy, 122 pound Canadian. For sure. <laughs> Yeah, and so you're the last world champion from Ontario, right? Yeah, yes, sir. That's crazy. But you know what? There's a lot. There's a lot of guys. <clears throat> Brandon Cook. Um, I'm a big, big fan of um, what's the kid, Lucas Bahati. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that kid's gonna be a fucking machine in the sport. I think you know. I mean, I just, I think he's really good. Um, you got the Southpaw. Um, Josh O'Reilly from Hamilton, the Wilcox boys, Brandon Cook has fought for a world title on short notice with an injury. I think there's just so much talent in the province, and I'm waiting for someone to become the next world champion and surpass me. Do you think? Do you think that'll be bittersweet in any way, or will it feel like you're passing on the torch? Like without you, it wouldn't be the same. Absolutely. I, I'm going to be happy. And that's what I'm, I'm hoping for. And I, you know, I talk to these guys once in a while on social media and I try to give them my advice and my encouragement because I want greatness for the province. When I became the first world champion after so many years, I wanted to open the floodgates for these other young fighters to be like, Hey, you know what? It is possible. Yeah. We're from Ontario. We're from Canada, but it, it's doable. I can, you know I mean? I felt that I got to do that. It made me happy. And I want to see these other guys do that. I want to see Brandon Cook, Josh O'Reilly, the Wilcox brothers, Lucas Potter. I want to see them all get world titles. All yeah. of them. Yeah, yeah. No, us too. And you know, we were supposed to be calling this past Saturday, you and I. Of course, uh, for those who don't know, Steve and I are broadcast partners for uh, the United Boxing Promotion shows out in Brampton. We were supposed to be calling a big show uh, this past Saturday. 
Uh, my birthday would have been a great way to, to celebrate, but didn't happen. But, you know, you've been there ringside watching these guys come up. And I see when they look at you watching them um, during it and listen to what you're saying versus what I'm saying is just some guy who's talking. It's a big difference. I mean, they look up to you as um, a trailblazer. Do you personally, though, feel like you don't get the credit that maybe you deserve as a Canadian two-time champion? Or do you feel um, pleased overall with how everything kind of shook out with your career over those years? Like I said, I'm just a white kid from Sarnia, Ontario. I'm grateful for everything that I get. I worked hard to get to where I got to, but I'm not looking for people to want to be around me or, or want my autograph or, or want to bow down to me. Like I'm just a regular dude like you hang or Ryan when you hang and you know I mean I'm just a normal guy like, I don't give a shit about people bowing down um it's nice to be acknowledged for for the efforts that I put in but it don't matter to me either way I don't give a shit <laughs> I love it I love it because you're a straight shooter and I know that what you're saying right there is real um and so you know that, that that's fantastic man now um let's talk a little bit about the transition out of being a pro fighter, a high level pro fighter who had been at it for years, you had your ups and downs. I know we talked about it a little bit on the last time that you're on the podcast, but it wasn't a video one. We're going to have a different audience here. Um, what was that like for you going from being the Canadian kid to being Steve Molitor, if that makes sense? So the, that, that shift where you're no longer the guy that now you're a normal guy, a former fighter, everybody still loves to see you. Everybody wants to hear the stories, but knowing that you don't have that upcoming fight coming up, what was that like at the beginning? And how was that adjustment to your, your real life? I guess you could say. Um, it was a little tough. I'm not going to lie. Like me, you know, I mean, when, when the media is waiting to see to, you know, you go to the gym and the media is there waiting at the door to take your pictures and shit like that. Or, you know, people are just, you're, you know, you're more active, you're more famous, you know, you go to the mall, you go here, you go there, you're more noticed. But again, I'm a private guy. I'm just a regular dude. I don't like attention. I don't really give a shit. It was tough, um, you know, not to to have that level or that things or that that hunger to fight and to get into the ring. Like I miss that. I get amped up and going through training camp and stuff like that. I miss the financial reward of it. Obviously, I'm not gonna lie, and I miss the competition the most. You know what I mean? As I watched that Michael Jordan documentary, I realized, like, fuck, like, I'm competitive, too. Like, I don't care if it's ping pong. One of the things I should do most, I have a ping pong trophy that I won at a Filipino community center. <laughs> I partied all night. <laughs> I lost the first game, but it was a double loss of elimination. And I won the motherfucker. And there's guys there <laughs> with headbands and, like, serious players. I showed up with fucking jeans. Uh lost the first game i'm like fuck dude and i came back and won because i'm very competitive clearly clearly so really you should be a three-time champ forget about two-time champ you got to throw it baby you give me that trophy that, yeah yeah i want to see that i want to see that um dude i think that you know in watching that jordan documentary i realized what uh sets him apart aside from insane natural talent and that, that's actually a really interesting point there are certain fighters that I see that are very, very talented and skilled. Some young guys, I won't say who right now, some guys in Canada, but I question if they have that competitive edge to be able to get them past the competition that's coming up next. Do you ever see that in fighters where you're like, this guy's got all the skills, but that competition mind that you and Jordan have isn't there. Is that something that's, that you see and can a fighter learn that or is that innate? I think there can be guys who are, you know, regular world champions or just average and, and have that. But to be that, that superstar or that pound for pound king or the kid who won the first world title in however many years, you got to have that mentality of just like everything you want to do, you want to win. <clears throat> And it carries through even today, even my work life today, I'm super competitive. It gets me in trouble a little bit. Like, I just want to be the best always. I don't give a fuck what it is. Yep. Um, we're going to play, uh, what's that game, baby? Crow. We're going to play Crow. 
with my kids and I've told her and my mom, I'm like, listen, I'm going to whip you guys. And that's it. <laughs> Free day. Yes. Nice. Dude. Amazing. Gateway for new Canadians. And here's the Canadian kid taking their trophy away. Bro, what the hell? In jeans and like party <laughs> clothes from the night before. <laughs> Reeking of booze, just fucking like, all right, let's go. Ah, I love it. I love it. <laughs> and guess who I beat? Listen to me. I beat Chris Johnson in the final. Chris is good at ping pong. Don't get it twisted. Okay. We used to play with Adrian every day after we do our, our track and morning weights in the morning at the YMCA. We'd literally play for like two hours. We'd gamble like heavy money and Amazing. we'd play for like two hours. So and then we'd nap and then box later. You are Jordan. I mean, this is basically like watching that documentary, Jordan betting on the coin flips and stuff with the guys at the, uh, at the arena. Uh, this is amazing. Okay, there we go. We think <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, so we talked about like the future of Ontario and maybe who could be kind of, I guess, your successor. Like, what's it going to take, you know, to, for some of these guys and girls to become world champions? Um, it just takes, it, it takes the will. It takes the heart. You mean you got to believe in yourself. Like people know, like I didn't come off an extensive amateur career. Um, I was 122 pounds. I wasn't a very exciting fighter. Yeah, I was dominant. I won, I won clear. Um, so it was tough. And there was a time where I didn't fight for 13 months. I couldn't, you know, get a promoter. I couldn't be a regular fighter, but you just got to have the will and the mentality to just be like, listen, and just go for it. And I know there's guys, like I said, Lucas Pahati's a, <clears throat> a big favorite of mine. I see him right now in quarantine. Oh, negative falls. Being a soldier, just working out every day. I know the guys in Hamilton, the Wilcox brothers. I know Brandon Cook's a machine. And all these guys in Ontario can do it. But it just takes the mentality to, to follow through and just, you know, you never give up. Now, you know, this actually leads into something I also wanted to talk to you about. Because I know it's something that's close to your heart, you, you mentioned the mentality that it takes to be a winner. Um, but I know for you, uh, it's no secret. We talked about it on the last time you had your demons, you had your uh, substance abuse problems in the past that you somehow managed to overcome, not just overcome, but win another world title after that's a separate story we could go on. <clears throat> what kind of advice do you give to young fighters, these kinds of guys who are on the precipice of big things, guys like we talked about body, Brock Stump, uh, Cook, O'Reilly, all these kind of guys. Like there's more than just how you're hitting the pads and what you, you know, uh, uh, how, how many kilometers you could do on your road run. There's the whole lifestyle aspect. There's the drugs and alcohol aspect. There's the keeping your mind sharp and safe. What are some of the things that you talk to young fighters about in that sense? Um, it's tough, especially like when you get to a level or even just, you don't even got to get to a fucking level. Like regular household people just, like to party and drink on the weekends and <clears throat> and do coke and do blow and shit like that and, and experiment with drugs. And in the end, ultimately, like, for me, like, in between fights, like, after I used to get a lot of hand injuries, my hands would be fucked up. They used to give me Percocets as many as I wanted. <clears throat> and then I was like, okay, next fight, both hands are sore and my eyes all fucked up. So then it became Oxycontin. And I became very, very dependent on those. And then um, I had a lot of people in the outside world that be like, hey, Molly, like, we love you, you okay? It's for free drugs. And it's just, you know, I think it just cut my career short and it really slowed me down. Even though I never did it during training camp, I just think that ultimately it's what shortened my career. Mm -hmm. And it's tough to battle that, but you know, I mean, guys who really want to get to that next level, that Floyd Mayweather level, <clears throat> um, like Lucas Bahati, and even drinking and shit like that. Like drinking's horrible for you. Like um, just to to stay focused. And that's one point of my career which I wished I would have focused more on is not fucking around after fights for two weeks because or a month because those months ultimately cut my career short. I feel. <clears throat> 
Amazing, man. So good advice. Um, let's go to a question from uh, Eric Belanger, one of our uh, one of our Twitter followers and fan of the show. He said, "Great uh, trainer out of Montreal." Oh, or, okay, yeah. <laughs> different Eric Belanger, but. This week, this past week, they actually interacted with each other and my mind it exploded. Is. So this is a different Eric Belanger. I know I, I'm buddies with Eric who has his gym out here in Ottawa, uh, Final Round Boxing, and trains Castillo Clayton and uh, Pat, Patrice Volney, who we had on the show earlier. But uh, this is a different Eric Belanger, but he's still a good guy. So let's go with it. Uh, he said, may you please ask Steve to bring us back to when he won his second title and the journey leading <clears throat> up to that fight. I read he overcame some personal demons after losing to Caballero and winning his IBF belt back must have been exhilarating. Not many can climb that mountain twice and just the last follow-up so we don't forget it. He inspired a lot of young fighters and made a lot of Canadian boxing fans believe that our country has its place with the boxing elite. I thank him for that. So really nice message from Eric. But talk to us about that period. Eric, Eric, thank you for the respect. Yeah. Um, so you want me to talk about what led me back, to, especially like <clears throat> after all the shit I was doing in between fights. And let me, make, let me make one thing clear. Like I would fight, I'd get my money and I'd have a month off where I could just party and do drugs and shit like that. Um, but once I signed a contract for the second fight, I never, ever did anything. Like once I, con the, I met with Alan Trombley and signed the contract, it was clean and sober, diet, train twice a day. <clears throat> but in between that, but after I, I lost the Caballero and I, and I really fucking, my whole world came down. My wife was nine months pregnant. I had my first loss in the biggest stage possible. That could have, you know what I mean, shot me to the biggest stage ever if I would have beat Caballero, right? Like a, a unification for, for me could have been really big financially and for my my career um and i was doing a lot of drugs but then so that was in november 21st 2008 can you hear steel but this is my son steel Young champ hey steel hey what's up hey hey um and he was born january 5th 2008 nine, that, uh, 2009 <laughs> and but just before that, I remember Alan Tremblay called my 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 wife, my ex-wife, my wife at the time. He's like, "How's Stevie doing?" <clears throat> and I was in the other room. I can just remember her crying and just being like, "He hasn't moved out of the couch in two weeks." And this is my my wife who was pregnant at nine months. And I'm thinking, "Listen, don't be a fucking bitch. Like, he lost your world title. You're gonna be a father to a child. Like, he depends on you as a fucking man. Like, get your shit together. And don't be a fucking bitch." And I remember because I lived in the penthouse of a condo. Um, I didn't want to throw him in the garbage. So I'm like, well, if you kill him in the garbage, boy, you can go get those motherfuckers in like two days. So I went to the garbage chute of the penthouse and I just threw them down the chute. And that was it. Cold never, turkey like that. You never tried to dive in and, and get him back the next day or were you good? <laughs> no. Okay. 31 floors, dude. <laughs> Might have been a little rough. Might have cut that eye open, right? But uh, okay, so 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 once you were clean and sober, um, what did that feel like? That kind of victory, aside from winning that second title, obviously it's it's a huge accomplishment that so few fighters can even claim to have done and accomplished. But there must have been a, a, a separate vindication where it's like not only did you defeat him, you defeated your your old self in a way. Did That's one of my biggest victories. Like when I don't really tell people because I want them to fucking like, oh, what do you mean you're big? Blah blah blah. Um, but for me, like, that was the biggest thing, like, just to stop that cold turkey. <clears throat> it's not like I was doing, like, a little bit of oxy and coke. I was doing a lot of oxy and coke, like, like every day. After I lost, like, I went into, like, the worst depression ever. Like, you were there, Jason. Run the street knew about it. Like, TSN, Magazine, MTV Cribs, $200,000 to fight Caballero. My next fight could have been for, like, 600000 And who knows what could have happened after that. <clears throat> And not only to get beat, but to get fucking crushed in four rounds yeah. um, was, it was hard for me. Like it took me down. Can you talk a little bit about that experience of losing from being on the highest highs to kind of realizing. No pun intended. 
Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. Being on the highest highs to the lowest lows. But um, was that why you were really abusing substances or was it already kind of in the mix and you just took a dive? Like what was the, the psychological feeling after you, you lost that? Were you, was it, how, how long did that last for until you were able to pick yourself up? Is this such, such, <clears throat> like I said, after I lost the Caballero, which I think was November 21st, 2009, my son was born January 5th. But from November 21st to like December 15th, every day, 24 hours, nonstop, um, you know, peeling the coating off oxys and snorting them and just laying there. Jeez, man. Oof. So definitely a low and a low. Um, it, I mean, again, just incredible that you were that you were able to turn that around and become a champ. Nothing in over eleven years now. Nothing, not even close. And I've been at parties where guys have drugs and shit like that. But I made a promise in my head to myself for my son that that would never happen ever again. And I just, I'm a man of my word. Yeah, you're also one of the most dedicated fathers that uh, that I've met, man. I see you with your kids at the fights. I see you on social media, yeah. and uh, I believe when you say that that they're your oxygen, um, for sure, man. It's so clear. So Steve, man, look, we, I don't want to end on a, on a negative note about that loss. D throw me one um, great memory. It doesn't have to be the best memory from your career. Throw me a, just something that you like to sit there. You have your, your trophy case, you have your photos. What are some of the things you like to sit and reflect on as like, I can't believe I, I was there or I, you know, that I experienced that, like that must happen every once in a while to you. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Especially like when I walk by these things every day, I would have good memories <clears throat> or there's, you know, a new Facebook Xboxers and people are tagging pictures of me versus Michael Hunter and stuff like that. And obviously that my first world title in enemy territory against the undefeated hometown boy to knock him out for my first world title greatest thing that ever happened to me also to have the first and then my next fight I could see Rama to be the first fight world title fight over 20 years in Ontario whatever it was and to knock it end off in the round that I predicted the ninth round that was also an astonishing I remember I sit in the casino after all fucked up I remember sitting in the casino just watching people but it was just so busy and everyone was just so happy and people had posters and shit like that I just remember like holy fuck like these guys watch me fight and like this place is packed. Amazing, man. Amazing. Well, Steve, I mean, obviously we have stories that we could go on for days. We've already done 40 yeah. minutes here. So let's, uh, let's keep the, the rest of them uh, for the next time. I wanted to talk again about training out in Mexico and all these kinds of good stories, the stuff that you and I go back and forth when we're calling fights for four hours. Straight. You go to, Hey Ryan, you go to, you go to Mexico to train with Eric Morales, who is at the top of his game. <laughs> on Mexico, oh, fuck, they're gonna pay me. I get to spar him, no problem. Mexico, nice and warm, twelve thousand feet above sea level in uh, Toluca, Mexico. I had one track suit, and I slept in that <laughs> of my running shoes every night, trembling, just shaking. It was so cold there. But then the last two weeks in Tijuana, it was Boom. hot. <laughs> Steve, man, you know, what's what's funny. I was when I do the fighter interviews of all the Mexican opponents that come in be, before the United fights, I usually laugh at them because they're the ones telling that story. They show up in Canada and they got just their tracksuit. And I'm like, dude, what were you thinking? So same for you, man. But you know what? I've been in that kind of experience. My, my wife's uh, mom is from Mexico City. And same thing. I was like, wow, we're going to Mexico. First time going there. Like, <laughs> shorts t-shirts something no nah, it's not 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 quite so Here's my I, long johns buddy i feel you i feel you steve man um it's amazing to to be able to catch up a bit i missed being able to hang out uh, regularly when we call the fights so this was perfect timing just a, a couple days after um what we were supposed to be hanging out anyways obviously you're going to come back on the show and talk some more but uh in the meantime thanks for joining us man for sharing some of those stories steve and uh i'm really happy to see every time whenever we talk that you're still in the game you're still 
around fighters, inspiring fighters. I know there's, there's a documentary coming out about you, all sorts of cool stuff. So uh, amazing, man. And, and just great to see how uh, happy you are, to be honest. And, and uh, this transition that you were able to make from the ultimate highs in fighting to now uh, transitioning into normal life and, and a successful family, man. It's great to see, man. Jason, thank you. Ryan, thank you. I miss you guys. The first fight at um, United Promotions in Brampton, the CAA Center. We'll be there. We'll kill it as always. Yes. I love you guys. Um, great. Was it a great fight, North? It is. Yep. Thank you, fellas. Have a good night. All right, brother. Take care, man.